Good day. Uh, this is Ahmed Eldamati. Uh, I'm a lecturer of cardiology, Cairo University Hospitals. Uh, I'm one of the members of the electrophysiology and pacing team at Cairo University Hospitals. And today I'm going to talk to you about the approach to a patient with syncope in 2020. So to be able to uh, elaborate on syncope, we're going to go ahead and move backward a few steps to talk about transient loss of consciousness. Transient loss of consciousness can be categorized into two main categories, non-traumatic transient loss of consciousness and traumatic loss of consciousness. In our context, we're more interested with non-traumatic transient loss of consciousness, which can be categorized into syncope, our interest today, epileptic seizures, psychogenic pseudosyncope, and rare causes including subclavian steel, vertebrovascular insufficiency, subarachnoid hemorrhages, and so forth. It's important to realize that among these categories, syncopes, syncope is defined as transient loss of consciousness that is due to cerebral hypoperfusion. It's characterized by being brief and followed by complete recovery. The etiology of syncope can be neurally mediated, which is uh, the most common form, uh, namely vasovagal syncope. When vasovagal syncope occur in particular situations, such as exposure to unpleasant stimuli or cough, micturition, swallowing or defecation, we call it situational syncope. Another important variant under this category is carotid sinus hypersensitivity. A totally different category is syncope that occur in the context of orthostatic hypotension, be it due to medications or volume depletion or primary or secondary autonomic neuropathies. A third category is cardiac syncope, which can be classified into two main groups. Number one, cardiac arrhythmias, be it bradycardias or tachycardias, and number two, structural heart disease, namely obstructive lesions, such as aortic stenosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, pericardial tamponade, or, or pulmonary embolism. Uh, so this is a by chart that shows the percentages of different etiologies among causes of transient loss of consciousness. So we can uh, see that vasovagal syncope accounts for about 20% of cases, orthostatic hypotension accounts for about 10% of cases, Cardiac syncope accounts for another 10% of cases, but most importantly, close to 40% of cases remain undiagnosed. In terms of pathogenesis, at the end of the day, low pressure causing cerebral hypoperfusion is the mainstay of the pathogenesis. Whether this is due to low peripheral resistance or low cardiac output, because of the different various etiologies, finally, it would lead to cerebral hypoperfusion due to the low blood pressure and hence syncope. So this is an important saying about the impact of syncope. And it's quite an old saying that states that the only difference between syncope and sudden death is that in one, you wake up. That emphasizes how grave this symptom is and how important we should take it with caution. Quick numbers about the impact of syncope. 40% of patients will experience syncope once in a lifetime. About 1-6% to would require hospital admissions. One, it's responsible for 1% of the emergency room visits per year in some data. 10% of the falls by elderly are due to syncope. Major comorbidities occur in about 6% of cases and minor injuries occur in about 29% of cases. This is a bar chart stating how syncope could affect the quality of life. This data is based on questionnaires and surveys and it showed that anxiety and depression can occur in 70% of patients or so it can affect daily activities in another 70%, can lead to restricted driving in about 60% of patients, 
and an important number, it can lead to lifestyle change up to changing employment in close to 40% of patients. The most important hard endpoint in cardiology, mortality, we have to uh, remember that most cases are benign. And there is no difference in mortality between vagal syncope and no syncope at all. However, as expected, mortality increases when the etiology of syncope is cardiac in origin. The diagnostic workup in a patient with syncope is quite important and it addresses mainly three questions. Is it a syncopal episode or is it not? It could be psychogenic pseudosyncope, it could be epileptic seizure that you need to refer to your neurologist colleague. So you need to know whether this is true syncopal episode or is it not? The second important point is you need to try to find out what's the etiology. But if you cannot reach an etiology, a really important point is to figure out whether this syncopal episode is a high risk episode or is it a low risk episode. So in order to cover this diagnostic workup, we're going to go through a few case scenarios of different patients presenting with syncope. So this is scenario number one, and it's about an 18-year-old kid who was admitted for arthroscopy of the knee. In the anesthetist room, he was observed to become asystolic for 10 seconds during cannula insertion. The procedure was postponed while the anesthetist sought medical more information. The patient's mother stated that the patient and his father were fainters and this was often triggered by unpleasant stimuli. The anesthetist phoned the medical registrar to ask, can you get vasovagal syncope while lying down? There is more than one clue in this uh, clinical scenario that would point to the vasovagal origin of this syncopal episodes. Namely, the fact that is, it is triggered by unpleasant stimuli and because the patient is already known to be a fainter. And in terms of asking the question whether this patient can get vasovagal syncope while lying down, and the answer is yes. However, this is not the, the most common form. Uh, mostly patients with vasovagal syncope would develop it while standing or sitting. It's important to realize that there are some clinical clues for neurally mediated syncope, namely the absence of heart disease, the long history of recurrent syncope, if it happens after an unpleasant stimuli, prolonged standing, crowded places, hot places. It's usually preceded by some kind of a prodroma, most commonly some form of dizziness, sweating, nausea. It can occur during a meal or postprandially, and if it's neurally mediated from the carotid hypersensitivity type, it usually occur while wearing tight collars, shaving, rotating the head to one side. And there is a variant of vagal syncope that can occur post-exercise. So not actually during exercise, but after the patient would rest for a few minutes, he might pass out. And again, this is a variant of vasovagal syncope. Even if you cannot reach a diagnosis, you have to be um, able to risk stratify your patient. Your patient is a low risk if he shows one of the low risk criteria that points to a vasovagal syncope that we have just mentioned. Also, if he has a long history of recurrent syncope that has been going on for years, this is very highly suggestive for a neurally mediated syncope and is really a reassuring sign. An important bit is the absence of structural heart disease, whether this is by clinical examination or proven by an electrocardiogram, or proven by an echocardiogram. Our next clinical scenario is of a 55-year-old female patient who is non-hypertensive and diabetic. She has been complaining lately of bouts of flushing and fine tremors that is increasing in frequency. She visited her internist who prescribed some meds. While waiting in line in the pharmacy, she fell to the ground. 
few minutes later, she recovered. She reported feeling woozy and that uh, she never felt hitting the ground. Apart from borderline arterial blood pressure, her physical examination on recovery was normal. Her e electrocardiogram, labs, and echocardiogram were normal. This scenario is heading towards the possibility of orthostatic hypotension because it happened while this patient was standing. This patient has some predisposing factor, which is diabetes, that might carry the possibility of peripheral neuropathy. And she felt woozy before she passed out. The constellation of this finding together with a triad of hypertension, bouts of flushing, and fine tremors points to the possible diagnosis of phacromocytoma, which can sometimes present with orthostatic hypotension and passing out spells. The clinical clues for orthostatic hypotension are happening after standing up, the relationship with the change of medication. So perhaps this gentleman started having um, a drug for his prostate uh, or he increased his diuretic intake that he was taking for some other indication. It happens after prolonged standing. There might be an etiology like our patient, peripheral neuropathy or so, uh, phacromocytoma. It can happen after standing after exertion as well. The other scenario is of a 60-year-old man who was admitted following a collapse. This had never happened before. Eyewitnesses described him waiting at the bus stop, then looking pale, sweaty, and feeling unwell briefly before falling to the ground. He made a quick recovery. His post-medical history included a previous myocardial infarction, he was normally fit and well and did not experience angina, cardiovascular examination, lying and standing blood pressure and blood results were normal. A 12 lead electrocardiogram showed normal sinus rhythm and anterior Q waves. Obviously, this patient has structural heart disease and the first bill that should ring is the bill of possible arrhythmic syncope particularly that, the, that this patient had a very short prodrome. Clues for a cardiovascular syncope are the presence of a definite structural heart disease, family history of sudden cardiac death in patients with inherited arrhythmia syndromes, cardiac syncope, whether it's obstructive or arrhythmic, is notorious for happening in the middle of exertion. It can also happen in the supine position as well. It's associated with an abnormal electrocardiogram. If your patient came in complaining with palpitation followed by the syncopal episode, this is a clue that he might be having arrhythmia. And there might be some clues in the ECG that points to arrhythmic etiology that we're gonna going to review later on. So even if he cannot reach a diagnosis based on the fact that the clinical history might be vague, there, you should be able to risk stratify your patient. So the major risk criteria you can obtain from the clinical history, from the physical examination, or from investigations. And they all circulate around the fact that this patient has either a substrate for arrhythmia or a substrate for a structural heart disease like a remote myocardial infarction or an impaired ejection fraction. The high-risk criteria that you might encounter in the electrocardiogram includes evidence of ischemia, heart block, severe sinus bradycardia, evidence of a bundle branch block or more than one fascicular block, non-sustained or sustained ventricular tachycardia, progada pattern in the electrocardiogram, a QT interval that is prolonged, and there are other few minor risk factor that we could review. This is uh, another clinical scenario of a Miss WH who is a 16-year-old female who complains of a frequent sudden syncopal episodes. She states that each episode lasts for about 15 minutes. Her parents witnessed these episodes and they mentioned that she never convulsed. 
Her physical examination was normal. Her resting electrocardiogram was within normal. Routine laboratory workup was normal. Echo was normal. She passed out during a head up tilt test, but without bradycardia or hypotension. So obviously this clinical scenario uh, is pointing to a group of patients that you might encounter in your practice. Usually young females who came in uh, complaining with syncopal episodes, which is not really actual episodes, instead it's psychogenic pseudosyncope. Of course, psychogenic pseudosyncope can be diagnosed from the history, but one of the important sure signs is when you send a patient to a head-up tilt test and the patient actually passes out, but without alteration in the blood pressure or the pulse rate. Another clinical scenario is of Mrs. S.A., who is a 25-year-old female who complains of a syncopal episode. She described sudden onset of rapid palpitations that occurred on her way to her dining room. Shortly after she passed out, she woke after a few minutes feeling unwell, but she noted that she injured her head. She never felt hitting the floor. Her physical examination was normal, routine laboratory workup was normal, except for mild microcytic hypochromic anemia. Echocardiogram showed mild mitral valve prolapse and the ECG was normal. So the question in this patient is whether you would reassure her as the previous patient or offer her medical treatment or do an electrophysiological study. It's important to realize that this patient is different from the previous one. So in this particular scenario, uh, she complains of palpitation, which points to an arrhythmic origin, and then she passes out, she never felt hitting the floor, and she injured herself. All these clues does not go in the direction of a psychogenic pseudosyncope. A patient with psychogenic pseudosyncope usually does not hurt him or herself, while a patient uh, who has an organic etiology can inadvertently injure him or herself, of course. So in this particular scenario, we opted to go for an electrophysiological study because of the fact that this patient had an injury. And we induced this tachycardia, which is an AV nodal reentrant tachycardia, and this patient had a successful ablation and never complained from her syncope once again. Another clinical scenario is of Mr. NH, who is a 35-year-old male complaining of a syncopal episode. He was having a febrile illness over the last few days. The day before his presentation, he passed out suddenly for a few minutes with complete recovery. His syncope was unwitnessed, noteworthy. His brother died suddenly at almost the same age. His physical examination was normal, except for a temperature of 38. Routine blood work was normal echo was normal, and this was his electrocardiogram. In this clinical scenario, we have to realize that this patient has some risk criteria, namely the fact that he has a brother who died at the same age, so we need to look carefully at his electrocardiogram. And if you look at the right precordial leads here, you will note a saddle shape ST segment elevation that could point to a progeda syndrome type two or three, depending on the ST elevation degree, be it more than two millimeter, speaking of a type two, or less than two millimeter, speaking for type three. So what would you do next for this patient? Would you offer him a Holter monitor or do him an EP study or offer a prokinamide challenge or just put an ICD right away? And uh, the answer, is we need to confirm the diagnosis in this patient. Type two and three progata patterns are not diagnostic for the syndrome. That's why if you're suspicious and the clinical history uh, points to a poss possible arrhythmic etiology, you need to confirm the diagnosis. So we give this patient procainamide challenge and in a matter of fact, his electrocardiogram changed it to the diagnostic type one progata pattern. So what would you do next to this patient? This patient now has an arrhythmic-like syncope together with a family history of sudden cardiac death in a first degree relative and a proven type one progeta pattern. This patient would now qualify 
for an ICD for the prevention of sudden cardiac death. Another clinical scenario is of Miss RK, who is a 19-year-old female who was resuscitated from a drowning accident. The last thing that she remembers was competing with her peers in a 100-meter free swim sprint. Family history was non-revealing. Her physical examination was normal. Her temperature was 36.5 degrees. Routine laboratory workup was normal. Her electrocardiogram and echocardiogram were normal. And the question is, what would you do next for a young girl who passed out during swimming? Well, would you offer her an EP study, put her an ICD, give her flaconide as a challenge, or do her an exercise stress test? It's important to realize that an exercise stress test would be very valuable in this clinical scenario because of the fact that you imitate the trigger that caused the syncopal episode. So this is her electrocardiogram at the beginning of exercise, uh, during stage one, and then during stage two of exercise. And it's important to realize that the forms that are latent of QT are not uncommon. And you can see here in panel number A that the QT corrected of this young girl was normal. While when she exercises, she started to develop pivot B wave and with an acceleration of the heart rate, her corrected QT interval reached 530 millisecond, pointing to a latent form of long QT syndrome. So this lady we're going to treat cautiously, um, given the fact that she has uh, a malignant form of arrhythmia causing her syncope, she would be started on beta blockers, she would be followed along and down the road she might need the insertion of an ICD if she developed syncope in the future. Uh, the next clinical scenario is of Mr. PM, who is a 24-year-old soldier who was undergoing an exercise stress test before being deployed in a peacekeeping mission abroad. He passed out during stage 3 of Bruce Protocol. In retrospect, he mentioned that he passed out several times previously, but he didn't make much out of it. It's important to note that his elder brother died suddenly at the age of 16. His physical examination was normal, routine laboratory workup was normal, echocardiography was normal, and this was his electrocardiogram during stage two of the, his exercise stress test. So this was his electrocardiogram, and it's important to pattern recognize this electrocardiogram, which shows a ventricular tachycardia of a changing axis in the frontal plane pathognomonic of catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. These patients, again, need to be treated with beta blockers, need to be assessed regularly with an exercise test, make sure that their arrhythmias are not inducible anymore. If there is high-risk criteria, like the reinducibility of ventricular tachycardia with exercise or the possible family history of sudden cardiac death, they might be an indicated for an ICD. ICDs can result in some side effects and complications down the road in this category of patients, uh, namely if these patients uh, get sinus tachycardia while exertion for example and they get a shock, the shock itself can start an arrhythmogenic uh, storm of sinus tachycardia that induces perhaps ventricular tachycardia and really to lead to frequent inappropriate shocks that could be avoided. So we should not rush into ICD implantation in this category of patients without trying beta blockers uh, beforehand. Uh, this is the next clinical scenario of a Mr. W.A., who is a 64-year-old gentleman who gives history of progressive shortness of breath over the last four years. He was diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of 35%, and he was maintained on anti-failure measures. Lately, he experienced two episodes of unheralded syncope, both occurring while he was sitting. One was unwitnessed, but the other one occurred while he was dining with his family, when suddenly he fell off his chair. 
When he woke after about one minute, he was feeling fine, but his family reports that he was cyanotic during the episode and that they could not feel his pulse. His physical examination showed cardiomegaly, a third heart sound, and his electrocardiogram showed poor R-wave progression. Clearly, this clinical scenario is going to the direction of a high-risk syncope that could be because of ventricular arrhythmias. This, the clues for this being um, the fact that this syncope happened while he was sitting. It was very short, it was sudden, it was not preceded by prodroma, and it was fo followed by full recovery. And the fact that his family described cyanosis and the inability to uh, feel his pulse during the episode. So the question is, what's the most likely um, etiology of this syncopal episode? And we've gone through that. This is probably a rhythmic episode. It's also important to realize that the combination of a syncopal episode together with dilated cardiomyopathy carries a poor prognosis. And this patient would be indicated for an implantation of an ICD for prevention of future sudden cardiac death, even without a pre-requested electrophysiological study, which is known to have a low negative predictive value. The next clinical scenario is in contrast with this one. This is Mr. W.A., who is this 56-year-old gentleman who gives history of progressive shortness of breath over the last two years. He gives history of an old myocardial infarction and he was maintained on anti-ischemic and anti-failure measures. Lately, he experienced an episode of syncope while he was in the washroom. He didn't feel any prodromal symptoms. He woke up to find himself on the floor. His physical examination was normal. His electrocardiogram showed Q waves in the right precordial leads. QRS duration was about 110 milliseconds. His echocardiogram showed akinetic apex and the joining segments with an ejection fraction of 40%. And the question is, what do you think the most likely etiology of this syncopal episode. In a matter of fact, this patient has the substrate that would possibly put him at the risk of an arrhythmic syncope, an old myocardial infarction and in areas of akinesia and an impaired ejection fraction. So we have to put this as a first differential. But there is another possibility that this patient had a vagal syncope just because of the fact that he has been standing in the shower. Um, so what would you do next? The fact that electrophysiological studies carries a high negative predictive value in the setting of ischemic heart disease makes an EP study the test of choice in this clinical scenario. So uh, you do an EP study, you see whether you induce ventricular arrhythmias or not. If you induce ventricular arrhythmia, they know, you know that your patient has a high likelihood that uh, his syncopal episode was arrhythmic in origin and you go in the direction of an ICD implantation, while if um, the EP study is negative, you have a reasonable clue that this patient uh, episode was probably not arrhythmic in origin, and you might resort to another investigation like a loop recorder or so to make sure what was the etiology of his uh, syncopal episode. So the question is, what would be uh, the etiology of the described syncopal episode and clearly because of the fact that this patient has the substrate for arrhythmia, his syncopal episode uh, could be arrhythmic in origin. Um, however, there is a possibility that this uh, symptom has been a neurocardiogenic syncope uh, because of the fact that he was showering perhaps uh, in a closed small room. Um, so what's the next step? What would you do next in his uh, management? Uh, would you... Uh, give him an event recorder, or do him a Holter monitor, or a Hidiptel test, or do him an electrophysiological study. Because of the fact that arrhythmic syncope is the most important uh, dangerous situation that has to be uh, excluded, this patient has to uh, have an EP study. Um, because of the fact that EP study has a reasonable positive and negative predictive value, in the presence of myocardial scarring because of a remote myocardial infarction. 
this patient indeed had an electrophysiological study. We successfully induced sustained monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. As you can see, there is an evidence of more QRSs than the P waves speaking of ventricular tachycardia. And the question is, what would you do next? Would you give him amiodarone, flaconide, put in an ICD, or offer him an ablation procedure? And we all know that ICDs are the only treatment modalities that would offer a mortality benefit in this group of patients. Amiodarone can control the symptom, ablation can control the episodes of tachycardias, but none of them has proven a benefit of uh, mortality on the long term. Definitely flaconide is a drug that is totally contraindicated based on the CAST study. Our next clinical scenario is of Mr. NB, who is a 76-year-old gentleman who gives history of exertional chest pain over the last two years. Lately, he experienced an episode of syncope while he was climbing the stairs. He woke up after a few seconds to find himself on the floor. His physical examination showed low pulse volume and the late peaking murmur with maximum intensity over the second right intercostal space. His electrocardiogram showed left ventricular hypertrophy. Obviously, this clinical scenario is um, addressing a category of patients who get cardiac syncope because of obstructive lesions, namely aortic stenosis in this particular patient. The fact that this patient gets his syncopal episode during exertion and the fact that he has clinical signs uh, and electrocardiographic evidence of a structural heart disease points to a high-risk syncope that has to be treated cautiously. The last scenario was of a 65-year-old man who was admitted following a collapse. He described half a dozen previous collapses with no warning. All were while in the standing position, but one was while driving. This was while he was reversing in to a parking space. One episode occurred while he was crossing the road. He had a past medical history of type 2 diabetes on metformin. He was normally active and independent. Examination of the cardiovascular system, lying and standing arterial blood pressure was normal. Blood tests and a 12-lead electrocardiogram were normal. So what's this clinical history pointing to? In a matter of fact, this is one clinical history that we hear from patients having carotid sinus hypersensitivity. It usually occurs with aggressive turns of the neck from one side to the other, like in this particular patient while he was crossing the road or when he was reversing into a parking lot. It can happen also in males during shaving or in patients wearing tight collars. So this is clues in the history that point to this type of syncopal episodes that we have to be aware of. So we have gone through uh, the diagnostic workup and we have talked about the management as well of some particular situations. In the next few slides, we're going to elaborate more on the management of particular clinical scenarios. Treatment of syncope obviously depends on the etiology. If you are dealing with reflex and orthostatic intolerance, you need to categorize your patient whether his syncope is of high frequency and unpredictable versus being of low frequency and predictable. In low frequency predictable syncope, you can educate, you can reassure, you can avoid the triggers. But if the syncope is unpredictable or occurring for high, with high frequency, you really need to do specific therapy, whether it's a medication or whether it's a, a, a pacemaker that needs to be offered to the patient. In cardiac syncope, of course, it has to be directed to the etiology, and we're not going to go further in the details. We have already touched on it uh, in the previous section. The remaining a category of patient with unexplained syncope, um, as we have mentioned before, this can be up to 40% of patients, and they are at a high risk of sudden cardiac death. So a patient who came in, you're not really sure about his uh, syncopal episode and what's its exact etiology, but you know that he is at a high risk of sudden cardiac death based on the presence of structural heart disease.
what would you do in this situation? You have to really consider the risks and the benefit of an ICD and discuss it with the patient and reach a combined decision. Few um, words about vasovagal syncope. Uh, the only class one recommendation that everyone uh, agrees upon is education on the diagnosis and the prognosis and the fact that this is a benign situation. Uh, frequently reassuring can help your patient. There are other options that can be close to A in, in terms of the indication, like counter pressure maneuvers or giving a drug like midodrine. But most of the other therapies that we have, including the salt and fluid intake, uh, are class 2B indications. Other drugs in this class are fludrocortisone, beta blockers in older patients, orthostatic training. Selected ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and dual chamber pacemaker. One quick word about counter pressure maneuvers. Counter pressure maneuvers can be helpful in some patients. It works as an exercise that your patient does daily, frequently to, avail to develop the to avoid the development of vasovagal syncope. It can be hand gripping. It can be finger clinching and it can be leg crossing. You need to educate your patients about these exercises because it might help him avoid an episode. In this slide, we are going to go through the algorithm that determine whether your patient will need a dual chamber pacemaker for his reflex syncope or not. The group of patients who needs to be considered are patients with severe, recurrent, unpredictable syncope that are above the age of 40. If your patient is not under this category to start with, pacing is not indicated. Refrain from putting pacemakers in younger patients with vasovagal syncope because the symptom might go away with age. If your patient falls under this category, you need to do two tests, so carotid sinus massage and the head up tilt test. If the carotid sinus massage test is positive and the tilt is negative, this group of patients really would benefit from the implantation of a dual chamber pacemaker and the class of indication is 2A. If the carotid sinus massage is positive while the tilt is positive as well, these patients are less likely to benefit and thus the class of pacing indication is 2B and it has to be associated with counteracting the hypotensive susceptibility with measures including elastic stockings, including uh, increasing the salt and fluid intake, and some drugs like alpha agonist as well. If the carotid sinus massage test is um, negative to start with, you have to look for an asystolic head up tilt test that would justify implanting the ICD. If that's the case, you can go ahead with implanting the ICD and do the measures that counteract hypotensive susceptibility as well. But if that's not the case, we have to look for another objective evidence of benefit, namely implantation of ILR. If you find an asystolic episodes in the ILR in real life, that's an enough justification to put in the dual chamber pacemaker. Again, if the tilt is negative, that's a class 2A indication. If the tilt is positive, the benefit is a little bit less. It's a class 2B indication, and it has to be associated with counteracting hypotensive susceptibility um, maneuvering. If the patient does not get asystole in the ILR as well, pacing is 100% not, not indicated. Don't go that road. Finally, uh, I'm going to go quickly through uh, the algorithm of treatment of orthostatic hypotension. If uh, your syncopal episode is to be suspected orthostatic hypotension uh, because of a decrease in the postural blood pressure that is systolic more than 20 millimeter and diastolic more than 10 millimeter, you need to figure out what's the etiology. If it's neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, you uh, increase fluid intake as much as you can. You can use increased salt as well. Drugs like octiriotide and pyridostigmine 
had some evidence, however, the class of indication is still to be, while other maneuvers such as elastic stocking, counteracting, uh, counteract pressure maneuvers, midodrine, uh, droxidopa, and fludrocortisone is a class 2A indication. If the etiology behind the orthostatic hypotension is drugs, you need to reduce or withdraw the drug, while if uh, the etiology behind uh, the orthostatic hypotension is dehydration. Again, you need to increase the fluid intake and uh, whether reduce a medication, if a medication is responsible for this dehydration or increase the salt and fluid intake on the long term and that's a class two indication. So that's by far the algorithm of the treat of treating orthostatic hypotension. And with that, I think we have covered uh, the definition of syncope, the etiology behind syncope, what's the diagnostic workup, how you need to know whether this is a true syncopal episode or not. You need to look for the clinical clues to the, the, that point to a particular etiology. And if you cannot do so, you certainly would need to risk stratify your patient whether this a high risk syncopal episode or a low risk syncopal episode and proceed with the management according to each particular uh, etiology. Uh, I hope you had a fruitful time. Have a good day.